Hey friends, it is Jenna What Is Up and welcome back to the Board Game Garden and welcome to the first official monthly wrap up and top 10 games of the month video for 2024. I can't believe we are already a month into the new year. Just a few days ago it seemed like I was celebrating New Year's and now we are already a month into the year which is crazy. Time goes by way too fast, but I had a great month of playing games. So I'm gonna be talking about all the games that I played multiplayer in the month of January. Um, I have all of my BG stats, which I will say, I am very, very proud of myself because one of my uh, big goals for the year was to start using BG stats again and keeping track of all of my plays, putting them into BG stats. I originally started off like the first few games that I put into BG stats, I was putting in the scores and who won, all those things, but honestly, I really don't care who won. I don't care what the scores was, um, as long our scores were, as long as I had fun, that's all that matters. So I'm just putting the board games that I played, where I'm playing them, who I'm playing them with, uh, when I played them, stuff like that into there. And I'm very happy to announce that I actually did it for the entire month and I'm going to continue doing it. I'm not gonna get lazy, I'm gonna continue doing it. So. We're going to talk about all the games in BG stats. I'm gonna give you guys my board game stats for January. And then we will get into, actually first, I do wanna do a little like small box card game section of the video. So I wanted to uh, give a few of like my favorite card games of the month because I have really started to enjoy card games and just like smaller box games. I think they're so much fun. And they end up being the ones that I truly play more throughout the month than the big box games. Um, but a lot of the times the big box games get put onto those top 10 because that is like what I love. I love a good big heavy um, like Euro style games. So uh, yeah, those ones just end up standing out to me in my head more. So yeah, I wanted to give a little shout out to some small box games and then we'll get into the top 10 games of January. So if you guys want to see those, then just keep on watching. Give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoy. Also hit that subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. We'd love to have you here in the garden. Comment down below any games that you played in January. What were some of your favorites for the month? Let me know down there. I'd love to chat down there. And without further ado, let's get into the January top games of January. What am I saying? Let's get into this video, shall we? <laughs> All right, so starting off the video with my board game stats for the month of January, I have my BG stats up here. If you guys do not know, that is the app that I use to keep track of the board games that I play. So uh, definitely check it if you have not already. Um, but yes, still, I'm very, very proud of myself for actually sticking with it for a month. So little, I don't know what that was, a little pat on the back. There you go. Um, okay, so let's go to the insights for January 2024. The total game plays that I had in January was 63 which is very good considering the best month that I had in um, all of 2023. I played 66 plays, so I'm down three from, actually it was December that I had that many plays. Um, so yeah, 63 plays in January. Um, that is 48 different games. And again, it still has it say zero new to me, but a lot of these were new to me. So let me count them out. So after counting, 35 of them were new to me out of the 48 different games that I played um, with 63 total plays. Um, so that's pretty freaking awesome. And then as for BGA plays, I played a total of 16 games on BGA. Um, I didn't do a ton of BGA playing in January. I don't know why. I did a lot like in the last few months of 2023, but I played some games like Tapestry, Far Away, uh, Clans of Caledonia, Patchwork, Wizards of the Grimoire, The Fox in the Forest, Hadrian's Wall. Um, I played a lot of Hadrian's Wall as well as Gnar. Um, I played Hens, which was fun, Maracaibo, as well as It's a Wonderful World. So those were some of the games that I played on BGA. And I think that is everything for the BG stats. So let's get into some small box games. I don't really know what I want to call this section of the video. Um, let me know if you have any cute ideas for like small box game portion of the video. I don't know what to call it. Small box corner, small box garden. I don't know, but let me know if you have any ideas, but let's get into the few small box games that I wanted to touch on 
um, that I played in January. So there are three different small box games that I wanted to mention in the video and touch on. Um, the first one is actually the game that I played the most in January. I think I ended up playing this like seven or eight times throughout January. Um, I played with a bunch of different people and it was a hit with a lot of people. Um, it is actually a game that I got gifted at PAX Unplugged. Um, the publisher, which is Barrel Aged Games, I believe, they gifted this to me and that is Stool Pigeon. So Stool Pigeon is a card game for people that love pigeons and hate their friends. Um, but this is a fun one. It's actually a very interesting game. Basically, you are playing as these like pigeon mafia members and you have four cards in front of you that are face down so you don't know what they are. You are allowed to peek at the bottom two cards and you have to try to remember those. And then basically your goal of the game is to try to make the four cards in front of you, which I think is technically like a crime scene and the different numbers of cards and the cards are the witnesses at that crime scene. There are some just simple numbered cards, but then there are some cards that have the pigeon mafia members on them that are like the different mafia members and they have some like different uh, abilities and stuff but you are trying to have your crime scene so the four cards in front of you that are face down um, you want it to be the least amount of points so the numbers on all the cards at the end you're going to flip them all over you'll count up the number on those cards and that will be the total number for your crime scene and then whoever has the least amount in their crime scene will be the winner um, so it's a very fun game you're like simply on your turn just uh, taking a card from the deck, you're looking at it privately, and then you're deciding to swap it with any other card at the table. So if it's a good card, you might want to decide to swap it with one of the cards in front of you. If it's a bad card, if it's like a high number, you might want to swap it with another player's card. And the card that you swap it with, you are going to look at it, and then you're going to place it in a discard pile. And if that card ends up being one of the Mafia members, you might be able to do some sort of special ability. Um, there's a few other things that happen, but basically everyone's just gonna be picking up cards, swapping a card, picking up a card, swapping a card, and then at any time, one player can decide to knock on the table, and that is going to kind of be the last round. They're letting you know that they think that their crime scene is the best crime scene and the lowest crime scene. So everybody else will have one more turn, and then you will go to scoring, and then whoever has the least amount of cards, um, or like the total amount of cards there, uh, whoever has the least number would win the game. So yeah, that is Stool Pigeon. I ended up teaching it to a lot of people and have really been enjoying it. It's a very easy, straightforward game. A lot of fun, it has a little bit of memory, so it kind of gives me the vibes of like Nana or um, what was another memory game? That's not a hat. Those types of things, which I've been really enjoying recently. So uh, yeah, that is Stool Pigeon. So the next small box game was actually one that I was introduced to by my friend Daryl. Um, he actually had it and we played it at his place earlier on in January and I really enjoyed it really really liked it and a box showed up in my house randomly one day and I actually got a package from uh, Pandasaurus Games so a huge thank you to them for sending this over but I ended up having a copy of that very game and that is Far Away. I don't know if it's quite available yet but I think it might be on pre-order right now. It is also available to play on uh, BGA which is awesome. It plays great on BGA uh, but this is a very interesting card drafting game where it all kind of makes sense once you actually score it for the first time. Um, it the first play of this I was like wow I would have played that completely different the next time uh, that I play it or I'm going to play it completely differently. Uh, but basically you are going to have three cards in your hand. There's like these square cards. They are different colors. They have different icons at the top and then they're going to require different icons in order to score some sort of objective. Some of them don't require anything and just get you victory points. Some of them just give you icons. But basically what's going to happen is you're gonna have those three cards in your hand you're going to play one down to a row. Eventually at the end of the game, you're gonna have a row of eight cards. And whatever card you decide to place down into your row, there's gonna be a number in the top left-hand corner. And whoever has the lowest number is going to draft from a pool of cards in the center. So you're gonna go from 
uh, lowest number to highest number of the ones that were played and people are just going to draft a new card and then each player is going to have three cards in their hand again. You're then going to again play down a card. Um, there's these different things called sanctuary cards that if you, the next card that you play after the first one, if that number um, that's in the left hand corner is higher, you're going to gain a sanctuary card. Um, there's some like map icons. So whatever map icons you have that gives you additional sanctuary cards to choose from, you're going to uh, choose a sanctuary card and those are actually going to get you some more like icons and stuff you'll need for your card. It's gonna get you um, some more like scoring objectives and stuff. And then eventually, after everyone has your eight cards in the row, you're gonna flip them all upside down and you're actually going to flip and score them one at a time. So the interesting thing and the brain burning thing of this card game is the fact that the card that's uh, the most to the right or furthest to the right is going to be flipped over and none of your other cards are going to be flipped over. So you're not going to have those icons in order to score that first one. So you kind of have to keep that in mind while you're playing the game that the first one that you flip over is probably going to be a card that is maybe going to just give you icons for some of the other cards or it might be one that you can score based off of some of the icons you got in your sanctuary cards and you're just simply going to be flipping over each card and scoring them as you go. So the one furthest to the left, you're actually going to have all of the other cards to be able to help you score it. So it's this very interesting way of scoring and until you play the game, you it might sound very, very confusing, but it is addicting. I've played it so many times on BGA, like I said. I've played it a few different times uh, in person, and it is a fantastic, fantastic card game. Uh, I definitely recommend. Your first play might be a little bit like, ooh, that was confusing, but after you get a few plays in and you kind of understand the way that you score, it starts getting very addicting. And I've heard that some people on BGA have scored over a hundred, I think like someone said that, I think my friend Kat said that someone scored like 190, which is insane. I typically score like around 70 or 80. So yeah. Um, anyways, that's far away from Pandasaurus Games. Again, a huge thank you to them for sending that over for review. And then the last small box game that I wanted to talk about is one that I unfortunately do not have right now, but I do want to grab a copy very soon, but it is sold out at all of the different places that I'm trying to get it at. Um, but this was a game that I was introduced to by my friend Kat. We played it at BoatCon, which if you guys haven't gone and seen, I did a whole vlog of BoatCon. Basically, my friends and I, we wanted to just play a lot of games. So we ended up planning a whole weekend of board games. We played from Friday to Sunday, constant board games. It was great. Um, I will put the vlog up here, but we called it BoatCon if you want to go check it out. Um, but this was a game that my friend Kat brought and we played. It's just a small card game called FTW, which I think uh, is for the win. And it is designed by Friedman Freeze. And uh, it's a very interesting card game. Um, I think Friedman Freeze also designed Fuji Flush and it kind of gives me the same vibes because it has like similar cards where they're numbered from, I think it's like one to 36 possibly. And they are all like rainbow, very similar to Fuji Flush. But it's going to be a little bit confusing to explain. We played it once and I knew that I loved it the moment that we played it. It is a shedding game, and basically you are going to have a hand of cards with a bunch of different numbers. The general gameplay of it is very simple, where you are simply just playing down a card, and then the next person to play down a card has to play something higher than what was previously played. But additionally, you can also decide to, instead of playing a card into the middle that's higher, then the previous card, you can actually play a card that's lower than the previous card in front of you. And that's going to be a card that you are banking to use later in the game on top of another card to make it worth more, if that makes sense. So once you actually do this, once you play a card down, you are actually going to be able to, from all of the cards that have been played in the center, you get to take a card and add it to your hand. Um, and then the rest of the cards get um, put off to the side or discarded. And then you are going to start a new pile. And then the cards that you have in front of you, like I said, can be used later to play alongside another card to make them like add up to a higher number because you are trying to pretty much get rid of all your cards 
But the thing is, is that at the end, your highest card in your hand, so once someone has gotten rid of all of their cards but one, the cards that you have left in your hand, the highest card is going to get you positive points, and then every other card that you have in your hand is going to be negative points. So ultimately, you are trying to get rid of all of your cards but one card that is a very high card so that gives you a lot of positive points because if you are left with any cards at the end, they're going to be negative. So for example, if I had a 34 and a three, I would have 34 minus three, I would have 31 points. But if I ended up with like a 34 and a 20, it's gonna be 34 minus 20. So it's gonna end up being 14 points. So yes, very fun card game. I love a good shedding game. It is a fantastic game and I really, really enjoyed it. So like I said, I am trying to find myself a copy. So the next time that I see one in stock somewhere, I am gonna grab it. But yeah, those were the three small box games that I wanted to talk about. But let's get into the top 10 games of January. All right, so getting into the top 10 games of January. I will say right now, out of the 10 games that are in this top 10, I only own three of them, which makes me really sad. Um, I do believe I am getting a copy of one of the games very soon, and I do want to purchase probably like three other ones or four other ones. So yeah, um, safe to say my friends have very good taste and when they introduce me to games, I tend to really like them. So uh, shout out to all of my friends out there that introduced me to awesome games, um, except for uh, Aiden trying to make me play The Witcher. <laughs> inside joke, inside joke. I know, I know. Um, anyways, going on to, or moving on to the top 10, starting with number 10. This is a game that my friend Kat and Kyle, or my friends Kat and Kyle introduced to me. This is a trick-taking game, but it is a slightly larger trick-taking game, and I tend to like trick-taking games in general, but I've been really enjoying, like, larger games that incorporate trick-taking, um, but this game is Brian Boru. Um, this one I've heard Jeff and Jamie over at Bosch's Meeple talk about a few times, and it always has caught my attention. The look of the game I don't love, um, and honestly when I was learning the game I was like, ooh, I don't know if I'm gonna like this. It is, I don't like the, the like, the art in the game. I'm not like a huge fan. And also there's a little bit of like area majority and stuff, which I'm typically not a huge fan of, but I have been trying to play more games with mechanisms that I typically don't go for. So that's why I was like, let's do it. Let's play some Brian Boru. And I actually really enjoyed it. It is quite an interesting game where, like I said, you are playing tricks down. So you're gonna start with some cards in your hand. You're also going to start, there's like a map on the board. You're gonna start with one of your player pieces somewhere on the map. Um, there are a bunch of different spots in different like sections of the map or different like provinces, I guess you could say. And each of those spots, some are connected by roads and then some aren't connected by roads. Um, and basically you're going to be playing a trick. So you're gonna play down a card. There are three different or four different colored cards. There's yellow, red, and blue. And each of them are going to kind of point you in different directions of different things that you can do um, on the map. There are a few different things on the board that you can kind of put your colored pieces into to have more strength in different things like the church and there's like a marriage track that you can go up and there's also some like Viking attacking kind of thing. Um, so I'm gonna probably butcher me explaining this but Overall, you're playing down a card, and if you win the trick, you have a stronger ability at the top. Most of the time, it is going to allow you to uh, place down one of those player pieces on the board, um, so you are putting more of your power or your strength into the different area majority spots. But at the same time, if you lose the trick, you actually still get some sort of ability at the bottom. It's not as strong as the top one, but sometimes you are actually wanting to lose the trick in order to to do these certain abilities at the bottom because those a lot of the time are going to be the things that are going to help you with going up that marriage track and getting some more of those Vikings, I think they're called Vikings, and putting more power or more pieces into the church area. I don't know if it's the church either. I'm just guessing at this point, but I played it once. I really, really enjoy trick-taking in games, and this one has a really cool spin on it where you're playing down those cards, and sometimes you wanna win and 
sometimes you want to lose in order to put out um, your power and do different things on the map. Overall, I really enjoyed Brian Boru. When I was first, like I mentioned, uh, learning this and after I like saw the game, I wasn't very excited to play it, but I ended up really, really enjoying it. And it really truly does prove that I need to not, and also if you're watching this and you do this too, I really need to not judge games by their cover and by the mechanisms because, you know, sometimes, sometimes you're just gonna like a game with a mechanism that you typically don't. I think it's great to just try a game at least once. If you don't like it, then you don't have to play it again but sometimes you're gonna really like that game and end up wanting it in your collection. Like I now want Brian Boru. So anyways, that is everything for number 10. That is Brian Boru. Moving into number nine, this was again, a game that Kat and Kyle introduced to me. We actually all learned it together and we played this along with my friend Steph. Um, this was the same night that we played Brian Boru. Um, but this game is a roll and write version of a game that I had already played and really enjoyed. And that is High Season Grand Hotel Roll and Write. So this is the roll and write version of Grand Austria Hotel, which I tried four months ago, three or four months ago, and absolutely loved. I think that is probably one of the games that is highest on my list of games that I really want to add to the collection. Freaking love Grand Austria Hotel. Um, but this one is, like I said, the roll and write version. It is called High Season. And honestly, if you've played Grand Austria Hotel before, the roll and write, it really seems like you're playing the full game but in a roll and write version, you are going to be drafting the dice in the exact same way that you normally would in Grand Austria Hotel. So somebody at the beginning of the round is going to take all of the dice, they're gonna roll all the dice, and then they're going to put each of the pip numbers into uh, different spots, um, depending on what was rolled. And then you are able to take a die from that like section. So you might take one of the ones and however many ones are there, when you take that one is how strong that one action is going to be. So uh, obviously from one to six, each of those actions are going to allow you to do different things on your board. So you have um, like a certain track that you're going to be going up that you have to be past a certain point by the end of uh, every few rounds um, or you're gonna get like a penalty. Um, you also can like open rooms, you can put like people into rooms. Unfortunately with this one, there is no like people that are like coming into your hotel. You're not actually seeing those people. So you're simply just opening a hotel room and then you are putting a person into the hotel room. So you're circling it and then crossing it out, which is like showing that you have opened the room and then occupied the room basically. So. Um, there's not as much going on as the full game of Grand Austria Hotel because in that game you are getting your like customers, you are putting them into the restaurant or the cafe, you are giving them those like the food and the coffee and the cake and all that. That part of it is not in the roll and write, which makes it a little bit sad because I really do love the whole getting the customers and feeding them before you put them up into the hotel. Um, but that probably would have been too much for the roll and write. So yeah, I do really think that they did a great job with the roll and write. It feels very much like the full game, but obviously it plays a lot quicker. It's a lot easier to play. So it's definitely one that I would consider getting in the collection because I really enjoyed it. But that is my number nine. That is High Season Grand Hotel Roll and Write. Number eight is a Devere game that I've been wanting to try for a very long time. I've heard a lot of amazing things about this one and that is Three Ring Circus. Again, this is one that I do not have, um, but it is again one that I would love to get in the collection. Um, this is one of their, it's not like a super small box game, but I think it's about the same size as like the Calico and Cascadia boxes. So it's like a square box. Um, but in this one, you are running your own circus. So you have your player board that you're going to be playing down cards into. And when we first started playing this game, I was so confused how the cards played down, but basically you have three rows of cards and you're going to have to play these cards from lowest to highest. So if you put a card in that row, then you end up putting a lower card, you're going to be placing it and that's going to push over the other card to the right. So obviously a higher card would be getting pushed over 
um, buy lower cards and those cards are going to get you different victory points in different ways. Um, you are also on the main board going to be putting on shows, you're going to be performing. Um, there are like small cities that simply just you put on a show and then for every empty spot around you, um, you're going to gain cards. Um, you can put on shows in medium towns or medium cities um, that are going to get you some more um, like better cards and victory points and then you can put on shows in the big cities and those are going to generate you a lot more victory points. Um, this one I ended up winning which was awesome. I have wanted a like circus themed game in the collection so I think this one would be very good. I don't think I have a circus themed game. I guess you could say that Scout is circus themed, circus themed but that does not count. Uh, so it would be fun to get a circus themed uh, game into the collection and Three Ring Circus was very, very fun. So that was number eight, that is Three Ring Circus. All right, so moving into number seven, I will say, good news, I have a physical copy of number seven, number six, and number five. So the next three, you guys will actually be able to see the box for it. Um, but the other ones I will be putting up like digital boxes in this corner. But number seven, is actually a huge surprise to me. This was one of the biggest surprises of BoatCon, um, but this was a game that my friend Steph actually uh, gifted me for like, as like a thank you for hosting her at our house for the weekend. So Steph, thank you so much. Um, but this is Coffee Rush. So Coffee Rush has been a game that I've been seeing quite a bit um, within the last, like, I don't even know when I first saw it, but this was actually released in Europe and then I think it's Europe. It might have been Asia because it is from published by Korea Board Games. So it might have been in Asia that it was released and we are finally getting it here in North America, which I am very, very happy about because you guys know how much I love coffee if you watch the channel. And I'm trying to collect all of the board games that have a coffee theme. So Coffee Rush was one that I had to get my hands on and I was surprised by Steph with it. So again, thank you, Steph. Um, so anyways, Coffee Rush is a pretty simple game. It's not like a super heavy game, um, but I think the whole rush part of it is what makes it fun. Um, basically, you're going to be running your own cafe and you're going to be making different coffees um, as they are going down on a track. So you do have a limited amount of time and a uh, limited amount of turns in order to uh, get the ingredients for the coffee and then serve the coffee. Um, so on your turn, you have your little meeple on the main board, which is going to have a bunch of different ingredients. And the cutest part of this game is that it comes with little cups and then all of the different resources you like put them into the cups and all the different resources are different shapes and they are the cutest resources and I love the cups. Um, so yeah, you are actually like getting the resources and putting them into the cups. And then once you have all the resources you need for a specific uh, recipe, you're going to dump out the cup and put the resources back and then serve that recipe. But uh, yeah, on the main board, you're going to be moving your meeple a certain amount of times in some sort of route in order to collect the certain resources that you need for the coffee recipes that you have in your cafe. So your cafe is going to have a bunch of different cards that you're going to be flipping over and putting into your cafe. And then, like I said, they're going to be moving down once each turn. So they're gonna get closer to the bottom. Once they reach the bottom and you haven't served them, they unfortunately go into a negative um, point pile. And then you also have a positive point pile whenever you do successfully serve one of the coffee recipes. Pretty straightforward little puzzle in the center, but it's so brain burning. It is fantastic. This game does have, oh no, it doesn't. It doesn't have a solo mode. I'm so sad. Honestly, I think this should have a solo mode and I'm assuming someone is going to eventually make a solo mode for this, um, whether that is an official sol solo mode or a like fan-made solo mode. But anyways, that is my number six. That is Coffee Rush. All right, so moving into number six, this one is one that was gifted to me a review copy from Arcane Wonders. And this was a game that was on my most anticipated list for, I think it was PAX Unplugged, it might've been Gen Con as well. 
but I saw it at both of the conventions and I thought it looked fantastic. It is a polyomino game, which I do love, uh, but that is World Wonders. So like I said, this is published by Arcane Wonders and it was um, gifted to me as a review copy. So a huge thank you to them. Um, but in World Wonders, you are going to be grabbing different polyomino shapes of different colors and placing them onto your, I believe it's like a, like a city or like a town, just land. Um, and you're placing out these pieces. Um, you are going to have to pay a certain amount of coins. Each round, you're only going to have, I believe it's seven coins. Um, and you can only spend that much and then it'll go back down and then you can spend seven on your next or on the next round again. Um, but basically each tile is going to cost you a certain amount of money. Um, and then you're also going to be able to get roads. There's going to be some different uh, like placement rules. Basically you are trying to kind of lay out your um, different buildings in order to get these world wonders. So there's always going to be three out. I believe it's three. It could be different for different player counts, but I think we ended up playing this with the full player count of five um, and we had three wonders out at a time. And each wonder is going to have a different um, way of placing it. So um, there's going to, or it's going to require different things in order to place it. So uh, one wonder might require you to have it adjacent to one road and one blue building. So once you actually have that kind of set up on your land, you would then, from where your coins were, you would, in order to take a world wonder, you have to spend the rest of your money. So I think that's a really cool part of this game where you can actually decide right at the beginning of the round, if you really want a world wonder and you think that someone else is going to get it, you might have to sacrifice all of your money that round in order to grab that wonder because you want to get it. You don't want anyone else to get it. Or you could, you know, spend a few turns, you know, spending some money hoping someone else doesn't take it. And then once you're at like spent five coins, you could spend two in order to get that wonder. So it's just very interesting, a little bit stressful because it, it really makes you think about what everyone else is doing and really makes you look to see what everyone else has on their board and like which wonder that that person is going for. So it, it adds this kind of uh, interaction with other players, not necessarily like head to head, but like just looking at everyone else's board, it really adds this interesting interaction. So uh, yeah, I really enjoyed World Wonders. You can play it solo, so I'm excited to play it solo as well. You guys will probably see this in a solo playthrough eventually, but also to add all of the different wonders are like these gorgeous uh, like meeples, these like 3D meeples, uh, and they're all different and beautiful, and the production is very, very nice. So yes, anyways, that is World Wonders, my number six. Apologies if this video is going to be super long, but I, I don't know if you guys can tell, but I get super excited when I talk about games that I really like. But anyways, moving on to number five, we are almost there. We got five more games to go. Um, this is actually a cooperative game, this next game. I do have this one physically again as well. And this one was one of my most anticipated games for a while and I finally ended up just buying it. Um, and I'm so excited I did. Um, that game is Tesseract. So Tesseract, like I said, is a cooperative game where basically you are going to have this big cube made out of different dice and you are trying to um, like turn off the Tesseract before it destroys the world. Basically, I think the story is that the Tesseract appeared. It was this big ginormous cube that was the size of a block um, and then like the size of like a, a city block. And then it has now shrunk to the size of your hand and you need to destroy it before it destroys the world basically. Um, so you're going to be drafting these different dice onto your player board, and then you are needing to um, kind of play this puzzle on your board of trying to have different sets and different runs of different colors of dice in order to uh, place one of those dice into this like communal board where you're going to need one of every single symbol of one of every single color in order to win the game. So it's just this very, very, very cool puzzle. I really want to play this solo. I played it with my friends uh, Aiden and Tyler. We did end up winning, which was awesome, um, but it's very challenging. It is very puzzly, and I absolutely love games that 
use dice in really cool ways. So yeah, I really enjoy this one. Obviously it is my number five. I am very excited to play it solo, like I said. So you guys will see this one on live stream very soon as well. But there are just some cooperative games that come along that I end up just absolutely loving. I, if you guys have seen the channel before, am usually not the biggest fan of cooperative games, but sometimes just some cooperative games. Tesseract was a huge hit. Um, the Art Project was another huge hit that I really enjoyed as well. Um, so yeah, whenever those uh, cooperative games come along, I really enjoy them, uh, whether I'm playing it with people or solo. Uh, so yeah, that is number five. That is Tesseract. All right, so moving into number four, the next four or the rest of the games I do not have physically. Again, I was introduced to these by a lot of my friends, um, but number four is going to be Clans of Caledonia, which Clans of Caledonia has been a game that I've seen so many times. It is a slightly older game, a very Euro-y game about farming, um, but I ended up really enjoying this one. It is, again, a little bit of like putting like different buildings and people out on a map and having like different production of different things which is typically not something that I would like go for but we ended up playing this during BoatCon as well and I enjoyed it very very much. There's also like a market, a shifting market that if you buy a certain good um, the price of it is going to go up, but if you sell a certain good, the price of it's going to go down. So there's this little bit of like a market economy kind of thing going on there as well. Um, so you can like put out a cheese building, which is going to produce you cheese. And there's going to be like the cows that are going to produce you milk and the sheep that are going to produce you wool. Um, and then you can also do like a wheat production that's going to produce you wheat, but then you can also put out the like whisk I think it's whisk not whiskey I don't know what it is rum I what what wheat wheat turns into something in a barrel and you're going to be producing these goods in order to fulfill these different um squares that have different things that you need to produce um, I'm doing a really bad job explaining this but it is getting late if you have played clans of caledonia let me know down in the comment section I really really enjoyed this one and it was one that I didn't think I would enjoy as much as I did it's also on BGA, so definitely go and check it out there. There's also a solo mode, and I played it many times on BGA. Um, so yeah, that is everything. That is my number four, Clans of Caledonia. All right, so moving into the top three. All three of these are pretty heavy games, um, ones that I've been wanting to try for a while. Um, two of them are 2023 releases, which is awesome. And then one of them, I believe it was 2022 release. I don't think it was too long ago. Uh, but number three is going to be a game called Evacuation. So this is actually a space themed game, which I am typically not drawn to, but my friend Kat uh, purchased this one and wanted to play it. So we ended up playing it um, with four of us. And this game Holy manoli, I really enjoyed this one. Basically in evacuation, uh, the main board, you, I'm sure you've seen it before, but basically it's two planets with this like very cool like wavy track in between them. Um, but basically you have the old planet and you have the new planet and you are trying to evacuate the old planet um, and get all of your people to the new planet. Um, your own personal board, you actually can only collect resources on like one side or the other. So you have all of the resources on the old planet and you're trying to start producing resources on the new planet and you're trying to get uh, things onto the new planet and take things off of the old planet. Um, you're going up this track in the middle depending on what cards you are playing down into what spots on your board and you're just doing different actions on your turn. That is probably the best that I can explain it because there are a lot of things going on in this game. But honestly, that is what I love in a game. I love when a game gives you so many things to focus on and you really have to be super efficient with what you're doing and really thinking about all of the actions and what that is going to uh, move you towards and like kind of plan a few steps ahead. I just love those types of games. So in Evacuation, you really have to do that where you're planning on what resources you have on your old planet because you are going to have to pay 
from your old planet do specific things, but then you also want to start producing things on the new planet because eventually a lot of your stuff is going to be going over to the new planet. So then you have to start in order to do actions over there, you start to have to use resources from your new planet size of, side of your board. Um, it's just so interesting. And the cool part is, is that we didn't even play the full game. We played like the they recommend you play this way for your first game where the cards that you're playing down they actually all have different abilities and stuff and we actually played it where the cards don't mean anything you're simply just playing them into one of the four different slots that are going to get you some sort of action but we're placing them face down so you don't actually get to use what the card's ability is so once you do actually play the game fully you're going to be playing them face up and then that's going to get you additional things um you also get like a personal goal and stuff like that um but yeah oh my goodness such a fantastic game super excited to play again i think i actually might be playing it again this weekend um so that's really exciting at level up which this video is probably going to be going up well level up is happening but yeah get excited for the vlog for level up and possibly the next uh, level up retreat event at some point maybe this year maybe next year um, but yeah that is number three that is evacuation all right so moving into number two I will say that number two and number one they were so close both of these we played during BoatCon as well and both of them I think they were my top two for BoatCon um, but they honestly could switch depending on my mood um, but number two is going to be Scholars of the South Tigris. So this is a game from Garfield Games, which I absolutely love all of their games. Um, and this one was one that I've been wanting to try for a while. This is the most recent one in the South Tigris um, series. I've played Wayfarers of the South Tigris. I own Wayfarers of the South Tigris and we absolutely love it. So I really wanted to play Scholars and I knew that I would probably love it just as much because this entire South Tigris series is kind of focusing on using dice in interesting ways. So in Wayfarers, you're using them as workers on your tableau in order to perform different actions. And in Scholars of the South Tigris, it's this interesting, interesting thing, which I love because I love color theory. I actually went to college for interior decorating and one of the classes that I took was literally a color theory class and it was like one of my favorite classes ever. So I love the whole color theory part of the game where basically you are combining different colored dice and different workers in order to get different colors and different uh, numbers to perform actions on the board. Um, and basically you are trying to uh, translate different scripts and you are doing this in a bunch of different uh, things leading up to translating that script. So, so you're going to be hiring the translators, you're going to be gaining scripts and then putting them into the different guilds. You're then going to, once you have the different translators you need in order to translate a script, you're going to have to take them from the guilds and then translate them from a certain thing. I think it's from whatever that script is to Arabic. You're always trying to go to Arabic. Um, and then those scripts are going to get you different like objectives at the end of the game. And wow, absolutely amazing. I am so excited to play Scholars of the South Tigris again. I want to play it uh, solo as well. And I just, I can't get over the creativity of Shem and Sam. I just, every single game that I play from Garfield Games always just like wows me and leaves me speechless. And I absolutely loved Scholars of the South Tigris. So uh, yeah, that is why it's my number two, um, Scholars of the South Tigris. And my number one for January. This was actually a game that I had no idea how it played. We just randomly played it on the Saturday night of BoatCon and my friend Aiden brought it and I've heard of it before, but I was like not really expecting much from it. But then I absolutely ended up 
loving this game. Obviously, it's my number one. Again, scholars in this could probably switch spots depending on my feelings, but as of right now, this game, I think just the surprise of it has really just stuck around with me, and I absolutely loved the different ways that this game plays. Again, it's one of those games that has so many things going on, but overall it was pretty straightforward for the most part. Um, but that game is Tribes of the Wind. I don't know if you guys have heard of Tribes of the Wind or if you've played it, but I had like just heard of it slightly, but I never really looked into it too, too much. Um, the cover has like a windmill on it and it didn't really like jump out to me as a game that I like had to try. I heard a little bit of like some people talking about how the cards kind of worked like Hanabi where you can see what the card is on the back. Like you can tell what the like element is but then you don't know actually what the action is on the card and you are going to be playing your cards based off of what most of the time it's your neighbors. Um, what cards they have. So one of your cards actions might be uh, do this if you have more of this icon than your neighbors. Um, so I thought that was like such a cool mechanism. I've never really had to really pay attention to my neighbors so much and like what cards they had and then like depending on what they did on their turn it actually might change up things which I think might be like one negative thing about it is that it is really hard to kind of strategize as it goes around the table because once it gets back to you it actually might be in a completely different situation because your neighbors might have changed the cards or used the cards that you needed in order to do what you wanted on your card if that makes sense um but anyways you are using those cards in order to perform different actions um and gain different resources in order to build out your little like I don't even know, village, I guess. So you're first trying to like clean up the village by decontaminating because there's going to have these like contamination tokens all over your board. So you're gonna have to get rid of the contamination before you place down these forest tiles. And then certain forest tiles are going to need a certain number of wind riders to be there. Um, and then once you have those wind riders there, you can flip over the tile and place one of the little like temples. And that's going to allow you to get I believe a victory, like an objective card on the side, and each person is going to have slightly like asymmetric abilities. And oh my goodness, I love this game. And again, I think it was really just the surprise that just like hit me and I was like, wow, I was not expecting this. And that has really just stuck with me and I've wanted to play it ever since we played it. Um, so yeah, that is my number one. That is Tribes of the Wind. I would definitely recommend checking it out if you kind of let it like float underneath the radar. Definitely go and check it out. It was a 2022 release that I had not played until 2024. So definitely recommend checking it out. I'm not sure if there's a solo mode with that one. Um, but overall, I really, really enjoyed it and it is my number one of January. All right, friends, so I did a lot of talking there, so hopefully you guys enjoyed, hopefully I didn't talk your ear off, and hopefully this video is not an hour long, but I really enjoyed chatting about my top 10 games of January. Please give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoy. Also hit the subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. We'd love to have you here in the garden. Comment down below any games that you enjoyed in January. Maybe what were your top three games of January? I'd love to know and love to chat about that down in the comment section. Uh, but yeah, I am going to be leaving for Level Up in a few days. So uh, I'm very, very excited to play some more games and have more games to talk about next month in my wrap up or no, yeah, next month because it's not February yet. Um, yeah, anyways, I'm losing my mind. I love you guys so much. Remember, you are somebody's reason to smile and I will see you in the next board game video. Bye friends.